Hello and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I am Keith Kajak, originally from Wausau, Wisconsin, and I am currently an MFA sculpture candidate and interdisciplinary artist research cohort fellow in the Department of Art. Um, I was really honored to be asked to introduce Anna um, uh, before the whole pandemic started. It was uh, the, the Kohler Library was a, a great resource for me. Anna is the gem of that space. And um, it was a way for me to uh, sort of, it was it, it, be, between my studio and the library, they're my two favorite places to be. And it was also a way for me to um, escape the studio occasionally. And I spent so much time in there uh, that um, I believe I was one of the first people to receive these bags celebrating the 50th um, anniversary of the Kohler Art Library. Um, with that, I'm pleased to introduce Kohler Art Library reference and instruction librarian, Anna Simon. Today, Anna will be taking us on tour of this campus gem to learn about its history, how and why people research art, and to share some colorful examples of art books. Anna received a dual degree in art history and library science from Indiana University Bloomington. And before coming to UW-Madison in 2017, she worked as an art librarian at Georgetown University. <clears throat> Her research interests center around contemporary art and cultivating library community. Please help me welcome Anna Simon. Thank you, Keith. That was really, that was really amazing. I miss seeing you and all the other students on campus. So hi everybody. I can't believe I'm here live. It doesn't feel like I am, but I trust that I am reaching you right now, wherever you may be sitting, your work from home station. Um, before I get started, I wanna show you just a quick exterior shot of the library to get us situated. And we have a, uh, a little film roll of the outside of the library to kind of get us a little bit oriented. Um, the library is kind of a hidden place. A lot of people walk right by it and don't even know it's there. So, this is the LVM building that you can see. The Chavin is on the right. And we are loading down East Campus Mall here. And there's the library again. Thank you. You can see the Chavin. There is our bridge connecting the Chavin and the LVM building. And then the art library is right, right behind those walls. Those very fortress like wall. So here we are walking toward the library. This is what I used to do every day. So as he said, my role at the library is to work with students and professors in the visual arts and art history to facilitate their access to library resources. I teach students how to use the library and find books, articles, and images that they need. A lot of what I do here is to help people manage their research and make them aware of what's available. I was led to this particular career through my own interest in libraries and art. I am not an artist myself, but I've always been around artists and art, and I'm very comfortable, more so in a studio situation than maybe a living room. Um, but I also love information in libraries. And at a certain point, I realized I could use these interests together and work with art historians and artists. So that's when I decided to go to graduate school to get my dual degree in art history and library science. I worked as an art librarian at Georgetown University before landing here at the Polar Art Library in 2017. So for me, this is a dream job because I get to meet students and learn about their work, be it a thesis on medieval tapestries or a graphic design project. But I've also learned that libraries can be a little intimidating for people, um, particularly artists who may not always understand or see how you know, a room full of books connects to their very visceral physical work. So I really enjoyed demystifying the library for people um, and how they can make it kind of work for them. 
helping people find students find materials that uh, you know aid their art production. So with that said, um, I'm going to take you on a tour of the library today, and then I'm going to show you some of my favorite types of materials to look at in the library. And I'll talk a little bit about how those contribute to art research. Oh, there I am. <laughs> that, that's me. All right. So here is the Kohler Art Library in the LVM building. Um, you can see kind of a, a little line of windows um, beneath those trees. That's the art library. We opened in 1970 in our current location, which is the LVM. Conrad A. LVM building was constructed in the late 60s to house the art library as well as the university's art collection and the art history department. So it was a conceptual model that fused the three art-based units together. And it's really a very lovely idea um, that the art history department would be connected to the museum and both of them would literally and figuratively be supported by the art library which is located beneath them on the ground floor. So as you can see from this image, the architectural style of the Albion building is kind of a modern, minimal, brutalist style that ties it to the institutional design of the period, but also unites it with the adjacent um, humanities building, which is that large building in the back there. Um, construction on the humanities building finished right before the Albion building started. Here's an aerial vision. I kind of love imagining campus before some of the buildings that we know today were built. The Elvium building is circled in red. The humanities building is just to the left. And that X, that yellow X, is uh, the Chase Museum of Art. So the library is connected to the museum and we're able to look out from our reading room and into that beautiful glass space of the Chase Museum. Um, and it's just this lovely interchange of kind of like artistic ideas and energy, I think. One more historical shot here of the Albion building. Um, I just think this one is really neat. You can't see the Chazen yet because it's not there. East Campus Mall, which is now a pedestrian walkway, is that road where the fire hydrant is. These images are actually not of 2020, though. They're of the LVM building being constructed in the late 60s, 1968. They erected concrete barriers around the construction site, and those also quickly filled with graffiti. Um, so I just think it's interesting that here we are 50 years after the building was built, going to this extremely tumultuous social period in our nation and in the world. And 50 years ago, there were very similar um, things happening then. So I don't know if you can see some of the graffiti, but uh, some of it says, does the post office kill Trotsky and legalize reality? One of my favorites. Here is a, a couple shots of what the library first looked like when it opened in 1970. This is our journal reading area, which is still used today. We still have those dome lamps and we still have the plaid chairs. There's one behind me in my office. Um, in later years, we'd actually fill up that space with movable shelving. And this might look familiar to anyone that's been in our library. It's our circulation desk and it hasn't changed a whole lot in 50 years. Note the piece of furniture in the lower right of the screen. That is a card catalog, which is how people looked up books before our collection records were available on a computer. And I don't mean online. I mean like on a computer, not connected to the internet. Our original book collection combined the library of Professor Oscar Hagen from the Department of Art History with art titles from Memorial Library, some which were originally from the Wisconsin Historical Society. We had about 48,000 volumes at that time in 12,000 square feet of space. And I think we have a, another shot of entering the library. <laughs> We might have a third video. Actually, there we go. There are doors.
very secure at those doors. This is our main reading room. You can see the circulation desk there. We've got some um, exhibits. Unfortunately, a lot of those chairs are set up uh, because we have limited capacity now, but I wanted to give you that, that contemporary image. So I feel like this is the Wizard of Oz shot where we suddenly burst into color after the black and white images. Um, we have grown quite a bit since we opened a few years ago. We now have over 200,000 items and we can't actually fit all the books in the library itself. We're overflowing. In the 1980s, we installed movable compact shelving, which I'll show you a little bit later. It was the first, fun fact, it was the first compact shelving in the UW-Madison Library System. Um, and this comprises about half of our actual stack space. So actually, let's just take a look. Let me show you guys what the movable stacks look like. Students are always really um, kind of amazed by this. So we have a little video of some some moving stacks so you guys can get a better idea of how those work. You can actually see my office where I'm sitting in that little room right there. This is our oversized shelving. And you can see the stacks are kind of all densely packed together. And then there are um, little buttons you can push that move the stacks. Students always worry, will we be crushed within the stacks? Um, if we somebody pushes the button and we're we're browsing, and no, uh, you have to be as long as you're over 50 pounds. There's a weight sensor. So, uh, as far as I know, you you can't get crushed unless you're a small child or an animal, which is why we don't usually have animals or small children in the library. Usually, that is our photography section, and we will be diving into that in just a little bit. So we've also expanded the areas of campus that we support since we first opened. In addition to art history, we support the UW-Madison um, art program um, that Keith is a part of, the undergraduate and the MFA program. That includes painting, sculpture, printmaking, graphic design, photography. And then we also support the separate departments of fashion and textile design, interior art. We have a comprehensive art history university library, but we also support kind of the equivalent of an art and design school at the same time. Uh, and of course, our library is used by the curators at the Chazen Museum of Art for their research. I know we support classes that you might not expect, like English classes, material culture classes, history of science, etc. We are also open to the public normally in in non-pandemic years, we are open to the public. So you are welcome to come in and browse our stacks, sit and read. Um, you can even get a community borrowing card and check out material that circulates. So we are a public institution and we are open to the public. So we're proud to also support the Madison community as well. Some shots of what our library looks like when there are actually people in the library. We'll get back there soon. It's our circulation desk and the reading room. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about collections, and then I'm going to show you some of our items. So we do now um, have over 200,000 items um, that spans all of art history, including non-Western art, material culture, and contemporary art. The kinds of books that we have here for research include regular books, but also journals, um, exhibition catalogs, museum guides, artist books, sale and auction catalogs, as well as books that are more introductory material as well. We have a large reference collection, um, actually kind of all around me right now in my office, which includes dictionaries of art terminology, um, biographical dictionaries, encyclopedias, directories, some of this is online, but a lot of it is actually still in print. So people do need to come in and visit the library for some of the, the reference material. Some uh, areas of particular strength that we have include African art, contemporary Chinese art, decorative arts, 
uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, because we are in Wisconsin, it's the birthplace of Frank Lloyd Wright, the Prairie School, uh, Medieval Art and Architecture, and 20th Century German and Austrian Art. So these collection areas um, kind of parallel the development or um, rather the uh, hiring of faculty. So we're going to do kind of a, a deep dive into some of our art books now. Um, we have a place uh, called The Cage, and I wanted to show you this particular area. Uh, I think it's our, our last video footage. We want to roll back. So here's our reading room windows overlooking to the Chazen, and that's an amazing yarn sculpture by one of our former MFA students. This is called The Cage, and it sounds creepy and scary, um, but it is a place that most art libraries and most special libraries in general have. It's a locked area for materials that are considered um, rare, maybe delicate, more expensive items, anything that we just kind of want to to keep more secure tabs on. It includes a lot of oversized kind of flat items. And my favorite section right there, some photo books, which I'll be showing you in a moment. So if you ever hear uh, a librarian talk about a cage, they're not talking about like a, a zoo place, they're talking about a cage full of books. So let's talk more about books. That's that's my favorite part. That's the best part. So a lot of times when people find out I'm a librarian, they, back when I talk to people besides my immediate family, um, they act surprised and ask me if there were still books, which is not really something you should say to a librarian, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's my job to kind of dispel that myth. Um, it's true that a lot of material has moved online um, and we have more and more now that's available via ebooks or PDFs. but a lot of our holdings only exist in print and it will probably continue like that for some time. So our books in the art library are heavily oriented toward image reproductions over all other formats. Um, in particular, exhibition catalogs, um, these are some examples right now that we're looking at. Um, and these often have material um, images in particular that aren't reproduced anywhere else. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to find the contents of these books um, online. And just to clarify what an exhibition catalog is, an exhibition catalog is a kind of documentation of a museum show. So oh, this model, that is not an exhibition catalog, by the way. That's just something I found in the stacks that I was intrigued by. Um, the exhibition catalog model um, existing only in print, that's starting to change as museums and galleries are increasingly publishing digital catalogs, which make digital facsimiles or artwork more readily available. Um, for example, the Getty Foundation has an online scholarly catalog initiative in partnership with uh, about a dozen different museums like the Tate and the Art Institute of Chicago uh, to help museums develop online catalogs. And this is great because that makes them very accessible. Um, but this shift in publishing and exhibition catalog publishing is happening slowly, and for now, we're still very much a print-oriented library. I just kind of wanted to show you some of the variety that we have in the library to support our students and instructors. Um, this is actually an, an artist book, which is uh, an art object that is also considered to be a book. We have a collection of about 12, 1,200 artist books now. We won't be looking at any today, but it is a, a special collection that the library um, really loves to uh, show people. Here's another artist book about Frida Kahlo. Great. 
So let's talk about exhibition catalogs. Um, it's one of our really important categories of books here in the library. Um, and they're published, as I said, in conjunction with museum shows. Um, these are the books that you probably see piled in the gift store that you might have to walk by after you go to an exhibit, back when you went to exhibit. Um, and they're important for art historians and artists alike for multiple reasons. Um, so they document the exhibit first and foremost, um, which is usually organized by one museum or a number of museums and then that exhibit tours to multiple museums, sometimes internationally. Um, these shows are often gathering art that has never been exhibited together before. So it might be the work of a solo artist, which we'll see examples of, or it might be a group show or a thematic show that takes uh, you know, a work of art here and a work of art there from very disparate places. Um, so consequently, the artwork may not actually be out there for public consumption unless it's through this museum show. I remember one time I went to a show on um, Corbet, the French painter, and there were many, many works in that show that were owned by private collectors who had very generously um, loaned their work just for the show. Um, so that was kind of like my one chance to see those works of art um, because they weren't necessarily photographed for the public consumption. I wouldn't have been able to find them on the internet. So exhibition catalogs give us this um, kind of privileged window into, um, into an artist oeuvre or a thematic exploration. Um, let's see. We can actually, why don't we kind of take a look at one of these exhibition catalogs. I've got one ready to show you, but I'm not done talking about them yet. Um, exhibition catalogs typically include essays by the curators of the show who have spent um, an extraordinary amount of time researching the artists and the artworks within. Um, there's usually, actually, why don't we go ahead and show our, our second camera and I'll, I'll give you guys a, a peek at what I'm talking about here. The catalogs typically include um, essays by scholars who can contextualize the topics for you further. Um, a checklist of the show so that we can know exactly what was being exhibited. And then uh, additional scholarship uh, research that's very specific to that show. Um, people tend to think of everything being online all the time on demand, but this just isn't true. Um, and a lot of material in these exhibition catalogs um, won't be found anywhere else. So it's always, always best to see an exhibition in person, of course, but we can't always fly over to the Tate or make it to San Francisco every time there's an amazing new show. So um, an exhibition catalog, I think, is really the second best thing to actually see in the show. Um, let me introduce this book. This is Toma Ach Klint, Painting for the Future. Uh, this book came out a couple years ago and it has been just like the show that it documents uh, a, a smash. <laughs> um, some exhibition catalogs, by the way, are produced in, in very um, low numbers and they can sell out, which makes them kind of a commodity. This one is, is uh, it's been printed kind of en masse, so it's just fine. You can, get, you can buy this one after this talk if you want to. So we've got some essays here. Let me just, there we go. See if that balances. All right, that was great. So this is a catalog of Homa A. Clint um, entitled Painting to the Future. And this exhibition catalog is uh, really fascinating. It's uh, Clint, Clint, excuse me, as a fascinating abstract Swedish artist. She died in 1944 um, with over 1,000 unseen paintings. 
Uh, she believed the world was not ready for her art. She was probably right. And so she kept her work private and it was discovered later by, I believe, a nephew. So in recent years, her work has come to light and it's really changed the art historical narrative of how abstract art developed. Her work predates painters like Vasily Kandinsky and Piet Mondrian, um, who developed abstract painting according to principles of theosophy, um, which probably been reading casually in your spare time. Um, theosophy is a meta metaphysical philosophy. Um, it finds eternal qualities and meaning in non-representational shapes, um, particularly geometrical forms, um, which are seen as pure and universal. So theosophy is a way, when it's ciphered through art, a way to discern meaning from the chaotic universe. So if you have questions about the universe, um, you can check out this book and find your answers here. So theosophy was uh, kind of considered an, an occult philosophy and it was popular around turn of, the, turn of the century. So it turns out while Mondrian and Kandinsky were doing their thing, Clint had already been developing her own kind of brand of abstract modernism um, shaped by her own beliefs and not only theosophy, but spiritualism and occult. And we can now situate her work as really being a pioneer of abstract art. So she predated those other guys. Way to go, Hilda. Abstraction has always been a male dominated field. Um, so it's nice that Hilda could show up, and kind of turn the tables a little bit. Uh, she was working the entire time, um, just quietly. Just as Picasso was debuting his cubist painting, the early teens, she was already working on these. The Guggenheim had a smash um, six month show of her work in 2018, 2019 that resulted in this publication. It was her first, first solo show in the US, <laughs> maybe her first solo show ever, um, and 75 years after her death. Just for uh, context, these works are huge, um, about 10 by eight feet. So. When you saw them in the gallery, they would have really kind of overwhelmed you. She left behind 26,000 pages of notes dealing with her work. Um, and these notes um, documented how she created her paintings. So these paintings um, were kind of auto painted. Um, she would, she saw herself as a human vessel for messages from the beyond. Um, and she painted in trance-like state um, during these seances. She tried to create a painting a day. So she herself said, you know, I don't know what these paintings mean necessarily, but I am being, my body is a channel for their creation. She planned to create many, or excuse me, she planned to exhibit many of these paintings in a spiral shaped temple. Let's see if we can find the image of that. Up here. Let's see. Yeah, here's our temple. She planned to exhibit in this temple. This temple was never built, but it's really wonderful uh, that her show was in the Guggenheim Museum's rotunda, which is, if you've ever been inside, really a spiral shaped temple. So it's really lovely. So that is Homa. Next, I want to show you an example from our photography collection. Cindy Sherman, who is one of the um, photographers I studied in graduate school, um, who really made an impression on me. Our photography section is always a busy place. It's uh, very picked over by students, it's often very messy, which is great because we know that people are using it and getting in there. So Cindy Sherman is an American photographer um, who works alone. She takes her pictures by herself and she only shoots herself as the subject. And she photographs herself in various um, costumes or guises. 
I sure can. I have to be careful because not all of these are really ready for uh, prime time. There we go. Start with kind of a library image. So this series right here um, was her first major show um, in the 1980s. And every woman is Sherman herself. Um, she's dressing herself up, clicking the shutter remotely. Um, so they're, they're like self-portraits, but they're also kind of like character studies. And they function with a few different layers of meaning. Um, this is called Untitled Film Stills. And all of the photos are actually untitled. Um, they kind of recall roles played by women in B movies of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and these were a commercial success when the show debuted, but they were also um, a critical success. Feminist theorists really seized on the work as examining ways that, let's see if I can center this, there we go, ways that uh, gender is both constructed and performed, um, and ways that women are represented by the, the media. All of these images really uh, reflect variations of the male gaze. They're very kind of creepy and a little bit sinister. You know, there's a sense of danger in a lot of these images and a sense of the uncanny. In the 80s and the 90s, Sherman went through a lot of different uh, periods of recreation with her work. In the 80s and 90s, probably more at the 90s, she started doing um, what we'd consider to be kind of more appro appropriation photography. She started capturing well-known art historical subjects using a lot of makeup and costumes. Um, supposedly she has more costumes than a theater company. And I think it's really interesting to look at some of these and think about yeah, contemporary art and how it is influenced uh, by the past, but also maybe how images have been viewed, classic paintings throughout time. And remember, these are all Sherman. Sorry about the glare, guys. So she's appropriating the past and she's disfiguring it, really calling it into question. Judith and Hollow Ferns, everyone. All right. Our next catalog that we're gonna look at is really a colorful treat. And it also kind of deals with images of appropriation. Um, this is Kahendid Wiley. This exhibition catalog, let's scoot that down for you. There we go. A New Republic documents a show by Wiley at the Brooklyn Museum a number of years ago. Um, and like those images we saw of Cindy Sherman, these are also drawing heavily on art history. Wiley is an American painter in his early 40s. He grew up in LA and now lives in New York. Um, and when I first saw his work just in books, it just blew me away. Um, I had never seen paintings like this portraying the black body with such celebration and love. And it really hit me as soon as I saw his work that there was a large part of the world that was missing and had not been represented in most of the art that I've been looking at um, up until that point as a graduate student. So Wiley, uh, let me show you an example of one of these paintings. There we go. So Wiley is combining elements of old master paintings and replacing the white figure with a black body. And his, his initial approach to creating these paintings was to actually ask someone on the street to pose for him. He calls this street casting. And uh, he lets the sitter browse through old master paintings and pick an image that attracts them. And then he photographs them in that scene wearing their own clothes. Um, and so the image is, is kind of co-created between um, 
Wiley and the, the sitter. And one of the things that I really love about his work is that they work on a few different levels. Um, they're working to correct the absence of black bodies from Western art history, but they're also exploring these ideas of appropriation, masculinity and sexuality, pop culture, beauty, identity. Many of these paintings show these kind of hyper masculine men against this kind of lush broke pattern backgrounds. They've got flowers and um, details creeping over them. And it just really complicates an already really complicated image. Um, if you ever get a chance to see Wiley's work, definitely see it. A lot of it's very large scale and um, it's just a, it's a treat to see. Oh my goodness, I could show you guys books all day. Um, really quickly, I just want to introduce this book um, because I do love pattern and decoration a lot. This book is called Bitten by Witch Beaver, Wallpaper and Arsenic of the Victorian Home. Um, this book is it's kind of like a work of art in and of itself and it won some design awards. Um, and it documents the wallpaper that was very popular in the early 19th century. Wallpaper that was created with arsenic. Um, arsenic is the key pigment and ingredient in early wallpapers, as well as various cosmetics and household products. And it created beautiful shades of green, blues, and yellows, and was used to make very fashionable wallpaper that hung all over Britain's um, houses. It also made people very, very sick and uh, became kind of a widespread uh, public health problem. Um, the companies always denied the danger, um, but these are samples of the wallpaper and they are from, I believe, the British, the British Museum, the British National Archives. Um, and they're produced here as facsimiles, which means exact copies or reproductions. So the, the British Archive um, kind of created this book and asked a researcher to come in and write about it and, and document what had happened with the arsenic mining and the production of um, cosmetics and wallpaper. So this is just a gorgeous book and students can use this, this kind of material for their own inspiration in their projects, um, as well as um, read the research for the art historical merit. It's also just a really good story. So we're just about done, but I did want to show you one more work um, that kind of follows in the footsteps of that facsimile. Um, we have something called a uh, sketchbook facsimile. And those are exact copies of artist sketchbooks. We have a really lovely collection here. Um, and we show these books really um, routinely to mostly to art students so that they can see different examples of sketchbooks. Um, check similes are usually created in very small runs. So while they're not one of a kind objects, they are um, more rare. You can't just go down and, and buy them at a bookstore. Um, they're produced in, in limited runs. So um, as a library, we like to to get them when, when they are produced um, because we know we won't have another chance. This is one of my favorite sketchbooks that we have. It's called The Last Sketchbook and it's Jackson Pollock's sketchbook. And you can see here, it's, it looks almost identical to the original book. And you can see here the binding, it's a, a sewn binding. This is a, I think it's Japanese, a version of Japanese rice paper it was probably given to Pollock as a gift. And oh, sorry about that wiggle. It contains um, all the doodles and sketches that Pollock was doing at the time. It was also a telephone book. So it rested underneath the telephone in his 
house, in his farmhouse in upstate New York. And occasionally there are pages missing, and this is represented with just the absence of any, any page there. Switch this up for you. So I, this book is so interesting to me because a, a lot of it seems to be fairly um, undecipherable to someone just looking through it. Here's a list of artists that Pollock made. He was ranking um, artists at the time in an order that he felt was they were most impressive. Um, but if you start studying Pollock, and this is where maybe a scholar might come in and use a book like this. If you start studying Pollock, you get into his, um, his psychoanalyst um, analysis and his kind of belief in dream states. Um, and a lot of that is represented in this book through these scribbles, which would then later manifest themselves in his paintings. Um, and the book just keeps going like this um, until finally we get to the end of the book. And it just, it really stops. Um, and there are no more pages that are filled out. Um, and this is kind of an appropriate place for us to end. Um, Pollock died in a drunk driving accident. Um, so this was his last sketchbook and he was still using it at the time of his death. So to me, it's just a very kind of poignant, um, I guess, reminder of when works start and when they stop. So that is the end of the sketchbook. And this is something that you can come into the library and um, look at. The last sketchbook. All right, everyone. I don't usually talk this long. I usually have students talking with me, but thank you for hopefully paying attention for all of that time. Anna, thank you so much. Uh, it's really fun to get a little glimpse into the life of an artist through perusing their work and you know, everybody with music, with art, you're taken to a place of what it means for you, right? So really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, hi, everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so, and uh, our friend Tom Kaw from Mills Music Library has been posting links to references of things that you've been talking about, Anna. So that's been, um, very helpful, Tom. Thanks a bunch for that. So Jane Mayer actually has posted uh, the majority of our questions here. And so some of her questions include, um, are you tied in with the textile collection? Where do textiles land with? Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, originally, the textile collection was over at Steenbach Library, which is kind of the, the science library on campus. But just a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, um, we kind of absorbed the, the textile book collection. And we started supporting those departments over in SOHI, the School of Human Ecology. Um, so it's a little strange because textile and design is located over in the, the human ecology department, so it's a little bit separate from where the art department is, but we, we also support those departments. So we collect um, books on textiles. We have a, a TF collection, which is the Library of Congress classification for textiles. And I work with the textile classes as well. Okay, great. And that, that sort of brings up another question initially that Jane put out here was, are you talking about objects or photos of objects? And in learning the work of the library and really what comprises it, it really is books about art. You don't really have objects there per se. Yeah, that's a really great question. We do not. So we deal primarily with resources that support the research of items. Um, there is a textile museum on campus um, over um, in the Department of Human Ecology, um, and they have uh, their own archive over there. So we support their work, um, but we don't have um, textiles per se in this library. So most of our materials are going to be actual books. Although we do have a large collection of artist books and those really kind of push the boundaries 
um, because those are more like discrete art objects that some of them look like books, but some of them really take on um, the role of an art object. So you wouldn't know it was a book by looking at it. Yeah, those are little treasures, aren't they? It's really fun. Like it's a seeing into somebody's mind. How exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a project to put all of your books online? That's an interesting question. Uh, there is not. Uh, it doesn't actually work like that. Um, we can't digitize our collection and just kind of slide it online. So we did do a project actually that involved um, our textile books and our, um, our books on interior architecture. We looked at all of those that were out of copyright, which is roughly 1923, some materials that had been created or published before 1923. And we were able to put those online and scan those in their entirety. Um, and that collection is part of um, the University of Wisconsin's digital collections now, um, you can find it. Uh, but we can't, because of copyright issues, um, we can't just digitize everything, so. Sure, that makes sense. That would be a momentous undertaking, I would think. Yeah, there, are, there are projects that are doing that, we, but we're not part of it. The, the Internet Archive online, you can take a look at. Um, I think they're trying to do that project, and it's, you know, it's massive. It will take a long time. Okay, all right. Thank you for that answer. Uh, question also about preserving the exhibited books and, and things of special or delicate nature. Is there special lighting to preserve that or other conditions in the library to preserve things? Well, there are always best practices for preservation. Um, and I, I know all libraries and archives and museums um, try to adhere to best practices. So, you know, items don't get exposed to direct light if possible. We want to avoid any UV light, um, store things um, flat, um, in boxes if possible. And I'm talking about um, older items, not not like regular books like like this. This guy doesn't need to be in a box right now. This guy needs to be used. This guy needs to be in your book bag. Um, but things like maybe older items or artist books um, do benefit from being kept in cold conditions, low light, and being treated very gently. Okay, good to know. Uh, Tom Kaw had mentioned that President Obama chose Wiley to paint his portrait that now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. And he gave a link to that in the chat if anybody's interested. Um, another have, question. Oh, sorry. I have to say I, I made a very specific trip to see that at the National Portrait Gallery, which exhibits all the, um, the presidential portraits and there was a line. So you had to wait in line behind a velvet rope and then you could walk up to Obama's portrait and it's a huge portrait, so it dwarfs you. And then you, you would get like a moment with it. And it was really amazing to see people um, react, have this like very personal interaction with that, that painting, it was really interesting. Wow, that's probably an amazing experience you had. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Another comment, I wonder if the reproduction wallpaper, so when you were showing the book on the wallpapers, at Villa Louis copies originals that had the arsenic component. Um, and I think that's interesting too, because now with all of the DIY of chateaus happening all over France and all of these amazing wallpapers that you're seeing, I wonder if they're all loaded with arsenic. Had never thought about that. I think, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in this area, but from what I know about working with hazardous materials, sometimes, unless you're doing like a super serious abatement project, um, sometimes they'll tell you just to paper over it or floor over it so you're not releasing all the toxins, but that, that's not do-it-yourself advice, I don't know. <laughs> well, the colors are fabulous either way. So uh, one last question, how much collaboration with the Chazen Museum of Art do you have at Kohler Art Library? So we, we work with them on different projects. Um, we recently hosted, uh, they actually held an exhibit of ours, um, speaking of book art, which exhibited um, artist books from our collection as well as uh, oral histories of the artists represented. And these were all 
UW book artists that went through the, um, the MFA program here um, in the, the 70s and the 80s. Um, so that was an example of an opportunity we had to collaborate with the Chazen where they actually hosted a show for us and installed it. Um, but we also do little projects with them. Um, like maybe we'll just set up um, kind of a pop-up exhibit of books that uh, supports an exhibit that they're having. Um, or maybe we'll pull out um, faculty catalogs when they're doing a faculty show or something like that. So, you know, working at home, you, you, you're you so much more isolated and it, you know, it really helps me realize <laughs> how much happens from those small interactions when you're in proximity to another department. So when I kind of emphasized um, the exchange between the, the Kohler Art Library and the Chazen um, via those windows, having that kind of open sight line, um, I actually meant it. Like, it's, it's really great to have um, people, students, ourselves just kind of go back and forth and be able to develop little projects and big projects. Awesome. Well, Anna Simon, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of these treasures at the Kohler Art Library. I encourage everyone uh, when it's safe to do so to please check it out. Uh, thanks again, Anna. Really appreciate your time with us today. Join us next Tuesday, March 30th, and we're going to be switching gears to the sciences. We're going to be talking with Letters and Science Dean and Professor of Astronomy, Eric Wilcox. And he's going to be talking about what lies between galaxies and the matter that lies between galaxies and how that informs what we know about the evolution of gallery galaxies, excuse me. Uh, please visit badgertalks.wist.edu where you can check out our upcoming talk lineup. You can sign up for our email list there so you can be the first to know about the new schedule of talks. Uh, you can also please consider a donation to Badger Talks Live. We are grant funded, so we always welcome donations that support future free programs. You can also request your very own UW speaker uh, at that site if you have an event you want to host and you'd like to invite a speaker from any of the colleges on campus, um, you can do so there on our website. Look forward to seeing everybody next week and thanks so much for tuning in.